Thank you, everybody. <laughs> it's a 9 a.m. talk and sure. it's, uh, <laughs> on a Sunday. Yeah. So um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Arzina Hamir. My husband, who's sitting in the back, and I, um, we own Amara Farm. We have a 26-acre organic, certified organic farm in the Comox Valley. And we grow uh, a variety of market vegetables, blueberries, apples, nuts now. Um, we're setting, heading into the retirement crops, which are the crops that are at this level and this level. <laughs> the hands and knees thing, it's, <laughs> it's getting harder, harder and harder. Yeah. So we're planning, we're planning our retirement crops. Now, <laughs> prior to us farming, uh, Neil and I lived in Richmond with our kids. And I was the food security coordinator in Richmond and uh, ran a number of different projects. And so when I was asked to speak about innovation and, and things like that, I'm kind of, I'm drawing a lot on my experience on the mainland and a little bit more of what we're doing in the Comox Valley and, you know, hopefully open it up to discussion about what's possible in communities here. I do have to say though, prior to me getting really into it, I made some huge assumptions, and I just want to check in with everybody. Mm. Who here believes like the food system that we have right now? Tickety boo, not too much happening that's wrong. Maybe a little bit of adjustment in the corners or the edges, but we're all pretty good. I like the word tickety boo. Yeah, that's what <laughs> yeah, you really took to the extreme there. <laughs> or as who here thinks that we need some major changes, a blow up? Okay, all right, all right, good, good. So I was thinking, if, you, if there were any people in the former, we might have some problems. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I also really honed in on the word innovation. So one of the roles I also play is I'm a director on the Investment Agriculture Foundation. So this is a, 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 a body that gives out money. And one of the, the pots of money that we have is an innovation fund. And what innovation funds and innovation means to funders, especially when they're getting money from federal and provincial government, it looks a certain way. So it tends to look like this. A new, plasticky, shiny things. <laughs> or it looks like this, drones. You have no idea how many applications we get at our table for the use of drones in agriculture. Like, to, to many of these innovation boards and innovation wow. hubs, it means technology, mm. right? What I think of the toys, right? Mm. And this is not what I'm going to talk about. Because for me, what innovation means in the food system is disruption. A big change. Mm. For me, like this is, like I said, toys that are going to change things at the farm level. What I think we mm. need is a change at the community, societal level, um, and something that you know, really gets us over a hump and, and gets us moving in a very, very different direction. These things kind of enable the food system as it is. And if we want to see disruption, what I'm thinking about is more things like, you know, small scale intensive production that's mm -hmm. going on in many communities um, around, the, around the world, especially in North America, where it's really opening up people's eyes mm -hmm. as to what, how much food it's possible to grow on small acreages. Um, so, you know, that's where I'm kind of coming from. We do have um, some interesting trends that are happening in our food system. How many of you have heard about um, like home delivery, like sh home chef, like Hello Fresh? And, yes. You know, I'm really interested to see why, what is so appealing about this because, you know, they advertise themselves as something that looks like this plentiful box of really healthy looking stuff. This is one of the advertisements that I just told. <laughs> this is not an actual box, because from what I understand, the actual box is full of little spices and things in plastic containers. The amount of waste that comes out of a home delivery of food is incredible. 
and probably not where we really want to go. But for some reason, again, it's like people, the convenience factor, it's really, yeah, this, this for some reason is really <coughs> taking off, especially in, in urban centers. Now, <clears throat> so, you know, I'm not going to really talk about stuff like this because, again, I feel it's still enabling something in, in, the, in our food system that we really want to get away from. So I googled innovation food system, and if try it if you go home, <laughs> and you get like all these, and look at the images. You get images of circles and lots of circles, <laughs> <laughs> and, and crossover circles and stuff. So uh, you know what I think it's trying to get across is um, an understanding of our food system as a circular economy, as a circular movement of resources and as a circular, like, a bringing together of, of people. So I'm not, you know, I, to me this is a little bit confusing, and I think it's just my farm brain. Like, I, I don't understand what this means at, at, at the farm level, or just in reality. <laughs> but uh, hopefully some of the examples I'm going to give you of the experiences I've had, it will maybe bring out or at least enlighten what this could look like um, in real time, in real life examples. So we'll go ahead up here. So the rest of the uh, presentation is lots of nice photos. <laughs> okay. So uh, when, um, when Neil and I first came back to Richmond, I um, became involved with a group of grandmothers who started growing food for the food bank. Um, they were very concerned about the quality of the food that the Richmond Food Bank was getting. It was a lot of the supermarket sending processed, you know, a lot of pastas and breads, and they decided that fresh food was something that was really necessary and it was lacking. So they came together and started growing food in a community garden, just six boxes, and it worked. They figured out their systems. They got some advertising, and a lot of people started coming around them. And then the city of Richmond started to take notice. Now, it really helped that one of these grandmothers used to work for the city <laughs> at a very high level. So she knew all the players. Mm. She twisted some arms, and the city of Richmond donated three acres within a city park mm. to grow wow. food. Wow. So it, you know, it, of course it makes sense, right? To people like this, why wouldn't you use a park? It was a large 50-acre park, anyways. But at the time, it was just so revolutionary mm. for a city park to be used for agriculture. And for years and years, many of the planners pushed back against this. Mm -hmm. They were okay with the idea of community gardens inside of a city <coughs> park because. You know, this is the community coming together, but farming, that just doesn't work in a park. You can't farm in a park. So that's the messages that we were hearing, and they kind of, they were like, okay, fine, it's for the food bank. <laughs> <laughs> but it took them a while to embrace human activity in a park, and I think this was like the big shift that mm. had to happen for many of the planners, that human activity could not only take place in a park, but that it was beneficial. Mm. It increased the biodiversity in the park. So interestingly, where this is in Richmond it is in Terranova, the very northwest corner of, of Richmond. And the park is split by Westminster Highway. There's the like human activity side on one side, 50 acres. And then there's a 50 acre reserve that has just a boardwalk. And you're only allowed to kind of make circles around. And everything, there's no touching. Like you can't go out into you know, it, it's all wild and, and left for the birds. And a survey was done of species, of the variety and diversity of species, and on the human side, there was more diversity than there was on the area that was left to be wild. You know, when we have activity, we have these edges and we have disturbance, and it does bring in a lot more diversity of birds, of insects, of everything, than an area that's just left to, to be wild. So it, it opened up people, many of the planners' eyes, and then they started to be okay with the park. So um, just a schematic of what is happening at the park. So 
We have the sharing farm, which I believe it now is, is on the full three acres. It's growing food for the Richmond Food Bank. It, uh, at the time, so this was in 2009, was donating about 15,000 pounds of, of food a, a year. Uh, it was also providing produce to three community meals in, in the um, community. So these were meals that you know different churches would take a different day of the week and provide um, a meal, which I believe fed around 200 people per per week. Mm. Now, in order to do that, it took a lot of people, and most of these people came in the form of volunteers. Um, now. <coughs> How do you get 2,300 volunteers in any organization? Mm. <laughs> so interestingly, um, from the very beginning, the United Way was one of the big supporters of this um, initiative. And because it was on a 50-acre park, you know, there's space. And the United Way does twice a year <coughs> a day of caring. I don't know if you've heard about this, where they encourage corporations to pay their staff to come and volunteer. Well, that's wonderful. Yeah, so, you know, most of them go around and, you know, paint a, paint a wall at a <coughs> neighborhood house, but, you know, you're limited to the size of the space that a room can fill, and so we were one of the only sites that could take groups of 50 or more. Mm -hmm. So, twice a year, we would get 50, 80 volunteers from HSBC, Microsoft, like all of the tech, there's a lot of tech companies, hi, come right. on in, in, in the Lower Mainland, and we had the space, like, you know, 80 people on 50 acres, you, you, it's not that, right? right. So um, we built on that, and we started encouraging more and more corporations, not just to be limited to the United Way, but to come and volunteer together, mm -hmm. and it became a team-building exercise mm -hmm. for them. And then we started charging them. <laughs> <laughs> because quite frankly, you know, um, letting loose 50 bankers from HSBC on a farm, I would say 0.5% of them knew what a carrot looked like. And if I'm asking them to leave the carrots, you know, you don't want destruction. So we actually had to hire, you know, coordinators and people to babysit them and to <laughs> make sure they, they were doing what they were doing. So it was a cost to the organization. So we needed to recoup that cost. And, you know, at the beginning, like many of the board were like, oh my God, we can't ask people to pay the volunteer. No. Okay. Reframe yourself. You are asking them to pay to do team building because this is exactly what happens when people come together on a farm. They talk to each other. They're sitting across the aisle and the carrots. And they're and all the time, every group that we had came back and said, you know, I'm in the booth next door. I'm in the, the room next door to so-and-so. And we never talk. Like, but here we got a chance to talk. And it was inevitably, you would find at the end of the day, some guy stretched out on the grass looking up at the sky. It's like, time to get home. Oh, I want to leave. <laughs> Anyway. Back to your cubicle. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. I don't know how they can live like that. Uh, yeah. yeah, I know, right? Oh. So we have, you know, and then we also connected with some groups uh, that uh, Pathways, Richmond Youth Services, that would bring their, their own members to come and volunteer too. So this was also made up of individual volunteers, corporate groups. We also established a greenhouse social club so a club that met twice a week, mostly seniors, who would hang out in the greenhouse because it was sheltered. We put raised beds that were hip height so they wouldn't have to bend all the way down. <coughs> and they did all the seed starting for the entire farm and they would run 12 months of the year because you know, the greenhouse was nice and sheltered. Now, a farm like this also requires and still does quite a lot of funding. So. In the tune of like this was ten years ago, ninety thousand. I'm assuming it's it's been you know even higher now. Uh, it, the farm itself was part of a, the Richmond Food Security Society, which then also ran a pocket market, a farm school. Um, uh, you know, and the farm school was based. I'm going to go into that a little bit more here at the, at the Sharing Farm. 
and the interns from the farm school would also work on the Sharon farm and grow food for the community. So already you're starting to see the how entwined the farm became in many of the different um, agencies and projects that were working in the community. Um, we, the Food Security Society would run food preservation workshops and they'd use produce from the farm because you know when you have like a thousand pounds of beets, what do you do with it? You've got ex and you have to show people how to keep food aside. Some of that would also then be donated to the food bank. And we then supported high school gardens and school gardens through the production of seedlings. We would just plant extra, and those seedlings would help to start off many of the school gardens that were happening around the community. So, you know, it did become quite a, a, a complicated um, system, but it started off with a very simple idea of just six grandmothers wanting to grow food in six garden beds. So. Mm -hmm. Um, bringing it back to the very beginning hopefully can help you think that, oh, this is doable. Because it, it became complicated, but it started off very, very simply. So I mentioned the Richmond Farm School. Um, this farm school started in 2010 as an initiative of the Richmond Farm. <laughs> and the idea was that, um, as we know, it's getting harder and harder for young people to get into farming. Those who are coming into farming are generally coming from non-farm backgrounds. And they don't have the, um, I guess, the edge that a farm kid would have in terms of just the wisdom and the knowledge um, that would have been passed down just by watching and seeing how these systems work. So the farm school was based at the sharing farm and it um, was started as just a very experiential type of learning. Uh, there were no tests, no exams, um, but a whole curriculum of um, production, primarily based in what young people could get into without a lot of money. So that is market gardening, bees, goats, and chickens. The, the, the easier things to start off with. And so um, it would also it also ran on the evenings, Thursday and Friday evening, and then all day Saturday. So many of the people who started in farm school were trying to hold down a job as well, um, and trying to use the farming as a transition out of the job. So we needed to ensure that they could still pay their rent, but it, you know start training for a new um, system. And so. This, the class sizes were quite small, like a cohort of 12 to 15. But 12 to 15 farmers every year, you know, they started to really um, change, especially in Richmond, the, the, the look of the farming system in Richmond. Part of the, you know, um, graduation sort of, of farm school mm -hmm. was preparing a business plan for what they wanted to do going forward. University yeah, <laughs> right. And then the carrot was really again we had to twist some arms. The city of Richmond is actually one of the largest fa farmland owners. Um, they've done a lot of trades with developers that instead of their DCCs, which are development costs, um, a developer would donate land in lieu. So especially around the ring of, of the city where the farmland still is, um, a lot of this land got given to the city. You know, <coughs> Richmond Oval, the Olympic Oval, when that went in, because it was actually on top of a community garden, which was heartbreaking. <laughs> but the developer then gave the city, I believe, 100 acres of farmland. So the city owns, I think, over 300 acres. And they allowed some incubator farms on a five-acre patch. So, I mean, yeah. um, but that it was a big it was a big thing for them to to give that up. Um, but I think now they, they see the benefit of their ways because for a young person to own farmland or even get access to farmland, still difficult. So uh, for those of you who haven't heard of what incubator farming is, it's basically allowing a new farmer to practice 
what they want to do uh, on a piece of property. They're usually given a lease of three to five years. But, okay, you can be here. At the end of the lease, then, they're transitioned onto a more permanent site. So maybe a connection with another farmer who has land. And now that they have their skills and they know what they need to do, it's easier for them to kind of hit the ground running. They know that they can pay lease payments. In this system, I think the lease was like $100 a year or something like that. Very minimal, so not a big part of their costs. And you were supported. So you weren't just given the incubator spot and like go to it. There was um, a tool share. So a BCS was purchased that was used collectively and communally among the, um, the growers. Um, for those who were doing bees, there was an electric honey extractor, a cider press, some broad forks were purchased that could be used communally, some of the more expensive pieces. So, you know, that was, uh, <coughs> that was all part of the incubator program. So this is something that maybe, you know, even without uh, a farm school um, in your own community, something could very easily be set up whereby a piece of property that's either owned privately or by the community could be made available to some new farmers. We don't recommend any more than a half an acre per farmer. In fact, for a very brand new farmer, a quarter acre mm -hmm. is probably more than enough. Mm -hmm. Because by yourself, weeding, watering, mm -hmm. harvesting, more than a quarter acre, it's, it's a tough go when you don't have your systems in place. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, maybe not, again, none of this is like bright, shiny, new stuff. Sharing backyards. So back in 2009, myself and two other friends who I met through the sharing farm, they volunteered there. We decided, this was after the 2008 um, kind of food crisis that started happening. We decided, oh my God, <laughs> shit's going to hit the fan. We've got to learn how to grow food and do it really quickly. But none of us had farmland. You know, I... You know, Neil and I had a, a, a house in, in Richmond, but it was a tiny backyard. Uh, Luke was an airline uh, mechanic, and Susan was a landscaper, and none of, they both lived in townhouses, so we didn't have land. But this idea of people sharing their backyards or front yards, we put out an ad in the paper. Three people initially replied. We started and um, hit the ground running, converting lawn to garden though <laughs> for those of you who've taken grass out when you don't have a tractor um, it was a tough go but uh, we were able to convert at our peak five uh, back and front yards into production um, which equaled about 4,000 square feet again tiny right that's a tenth of an acre 4,000 square feet but we fed um, 15 families. We had a CSA box program. We went to <coughs> farmer's market twice a month with our excess produce. And it just enabled us to, again, practice and figure out what do we need to do to have succession. Like This is intensive growing. Whenever a bed was harvested, there was already something planned and ready to go and put in. So it's a very um, intensive system of production. But such an eye-opening experience and gave us, all three of us, <coughs> the courage to sort of say, okay, we can do this. And that's when Neil and I started looking for farmland. Susan moved to Nelson area and Luke is, again, still looking for land. But we all know that we have the skills that make it possible mm -hmm. to grow food on larger than just home, like for our own home use. And to run it as a business because that's always the challenge, right? Mm -hmm. You can grow things, but can you grow things profitably? Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Any questions about backyard sharing? Uh, it's also, uh, yeah. Do you offer the person offering you, you must offer them an incentive. Yeah. Do you negotiate with them? So, you know, interestingly, the people who provided their back and front yards tended to be seniors. Many of them living in their had been in their homes 30 plus years. They were also the homes that had the big backyards. And they couldn't manage the mowing of the lawn or just the general upkeep. And when lawns start to get out of control, that's usually what 
people who are used to more nefarious stuff, they target those kinds of homes because they know someone is either not there or is too frail to kind of manage and keep up with their home. So the, one of the incentives was just safety. Mm. Having people that they, you know, after a while they knew us, that they could trust, being there, there was activity happening in the home. Mm. Obviously, you know, whatever food we produced, we, eat, you know, please eat. And most of the people, like, we couldn't tell that they'd even been there. And they swore that, yeah, I grabbed some stuff. But, you know, they're not eating a lot. Um, yeah. So as much as possible. Because they were also providing water for the, for the farm. So as a new farmer also, so no land costs. There was never an, um, a financial exchange. It was always, because we were putting a lot of time and energy to take the sod out, bring in nutrients, you know, buy our seed. So, you know, the, the homeowner provided the, the land and the water. They got at whatever amount of food they wanted out of the garden, but, and then we sold the rest. So this was a for sale uh, arrangement, and most of the homeowners knew that. Over time, what we realized was that it didn't make sense to have, like, a huge diversity on each backyard. Like, we would have, like, you know, two rows of carrots, two rows of green onions, but... When you're putting a salad together and you have to go to five separate homes to get the salad together, we learned, okay, so maybe, you know, this is the squash yard. So diversity kind of broke down after a while, but and we pull veggies from other homes to give to the homeowners, but yeah. So that, those were some of the incentives, and they just liked supporting new farmers, too. They, they got a kick out of it, and yeah. Any other questions? So it's also, um, this is market under the name Spin Farming, small plot intensive. Um, yeah, and if you Google that, there's tons of examples of this. And it's still happening. Um, after a while, though, we just, I personally got tired of, you know, going around to five different spots, and I just wanted to concentrate mm -hmm. on one farm. Hence the, um, but this was a fantastic stepping stone mm -hmm. from going from zero, like basically backyard, to now, you know, growing a little bit for sale, to then farming. So sometimes you need that. Mm -hmm. If you don't have an incubator plot, this is kind of that stepping stone into the farm. All right. And apologies, these are not in any particular order of importance. I'm just thinking of some of the more innovative ways that we can change our food system. So growing food in our lawns, I mean, sorry if anyone's a fan of lawns, I think they're the biggest waste of time <laughs> and So very soon after Neil and I moved to the Comox Valley, um, I began volu to volunteer at my daughter's school. And for any of you who have young kids and who are maybe involved in your school system, uh, the food fundraisers tend to be a little bit <coughs> questionable. Um, <laughs> and, you know, cookie dough fundraisers and hot dog days and just food that I actually don't let my kids eat. <laughs> and I got kind of tired and the kids were always upset, like, oh, you never let us do anything. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I was like, okay, let's try this. Um, a group called Farm to School... Uh, farm to School BC, and there is a Farm to Cafeteria Canada, provided grants to schools to start salad bar programs. And part of the conditions of the grant is that you need to be serving a certain t number of times during the year. As much local food needs to be in that salad bar, and some education for the students. So there, it's not just a I'm eating, but I'm understanding where this food came from. There's a connection from, for the children and the teachers to the farmers. So it's like a three-pronged approach. So uh, uh, initially, three parents, we got together and we said, okay, we're going to do this, apply for the grant. We got the grant. It was an equipment grant, basically, to allow us to buy the salad bar unit, but also, like, very few schools in BC have cafeterias or kitchens even. We really had to do a bit of work to convert the kitchen in, in the school into something that we could operate in. So we had to buy a commercial dishwasher, an under-counter, which 
on their own are like six thousand dollars. They're mm. not cheap. So the grant went mostly to that dishwasher <laughs> and then a bit of you know extra for all the, the rest of the tongs, stuff like that. And then we just started and, and luckily because Neil and I were already farming, we were at the farmers market, we knew many of the local growers, we knew what was available. We could then start bringing in sunflower sprouts and beets from Seifert's farm. And so we knew who to ask to supply. Now, none of this food is donated. It's purchased so that the farm has an economic incentive to continue the relationship with the salad bar. The kids, um, each child or each family pays $3 per serving. They get, um, there are eight different vegetables in this salad bar program, plus two proteins and a carbohydrate. So it is a full meal. And the way we did it was that we would have the same standard vegetables at the beginning of the salad bar, and each week a different theme was chosen. So on Mexican week, we would have tortilla chips as the carbohydrate, beans and corn as, as you know, one of the fillers, um, guacamole, salsa, so that, you know, it, and then the dressings were all handmade. So that one is a, a cilantro lime dressing. On Asian uh, week, it is a um, rice noodle plus um, some uh, fried omelet and you know, chopped up finely. Uh, this, the dressing is an Asian um, sesame oil dressing. And you know, you have to be careful not to put nuts and any allergens into the, the salad bar, but you get the drift that every week, I think we had um, eight different themes, um, so that every week it was something different. We started with 30 kids, and here's what we heard initially. Oh, you know, my kid doesn't like salad. I can't eat it, no, no, sorry, we're not gonna participate. They don't, they just don't eat vegetables. And then we, Really? Because I see him stealing a lot of veggies from his <laughs> and, um, Okay, so a lot of the resistance came from the parents. Wow. And it was their own actual, their own resistance to eating vegetables that was transferred <laughs> to the kids. Because what happened over time, and you know, in the first year, uh, we got up to 50 kids at the end of the, se at the school season. Um, many of the older kids grade five and up, mm -hmm. unless they were already eating very healthy at home, not interested. But the younger kids, you know, they, they're fearless. They, they, they don't have many of these set things already. So as the older students graduated and left, and the younger students moved mm -hmm. up the ranks, we started seeing more and more kids participating. And now the salad bar at Cuban is at 250, which is oh, over two-thirds, almost three-quarters of the school is participating. Uh, it now requires mm, 11 volunteers to kind of make it run uh, from the initial three in, in two different times, set up and chopping and clean up. There are, you know, two volunteers help shop. It's now a little bit more complicated, but again, three people, that's all we needed to start. And uh, it still runs on a weekly basis. And now there are actually four more schools in the Comox Valley who have started salad bars. Mm. In fact, just on Tuesday, um, Isfeld High School started. They're, they're the first senior um, high school. And there were, oh my gosh, it looked like a thousand kids around here. <laughs> because they're one of the high schools that doesn't even have a cafeteria. There's no yep. food, nothing. And I think the smell of food just like... <laughs> <laughs> So now they charge four dollars because high school kids eat a bit more. But so now we have five schools participating in the Comox Valley, which I'm estimating is roughly a thousand kids who are eating salad at least once a week. But interestingly, it's translating to almost thirty thousand dollars of purchasing that is going into the local food economy. So I'm not talking about just buying from Costco, I'm talking about buying from Seifert's, from Eat More Sprouts. Like this is the portion of the purchasing that is going directly into mm -hmm. local farms. And you know, again, we could not ask farmers to donate this. Mm -hmm. This has to be um, an economic incentive as well. And interestingly, all of the salad bars that I know are running on a profit. 
it's interesting how much, like three dollars, you think that's nothing, but it actually only costs two dollars to put that plate together because all the veggies are being chopped by the parents. The dressings are all being made by from scratch. And so the salad bar at Hugh Band makes a profit of $300 every week. And many of the other salad bars are also say, stating that it's profitable. So now it's also becoming an incentive for the packs to keep running the salad bar because, you know, the, the Hugh Band salad bar, I think, raised $6,000 just from salad and you know, just from the, and the parents love that their kids are eating healthy and it's translating into actually better eating at home. They're eating more vegetables. Um, they're starting to do a few studies on the salad bar programs in the Valley. So I'll be able to report more outcomes around eating more food veggies, but just from the surface, the economic benefits and the amount of people participating, it's becoming a really exciting and it's now becoming ingrained and, and you know, there's the assumption that all the schools in the, in the Comox Valley have salad bar, but now it's almost like, oh, you don't have a salad bar? Like, why not? And, yeah, so that's, that's exciting. Um, coming back to farming. Uh, you know, I have never been someone who likes to farm by herself. Mm -hmm. I've always tried to bring people around me because you know what? It can be boring. <laughs> yeah. And there's some tasks like, you know, rolling um, giant water cisterns. You just need extra hands around you, right? And so, you know, I immediately sort of searched out those other farmers who were like-minded, and I would constantly go and volunteer at their farms. And interestingly, you kind of get that, oh, I owe you, okay, yeah, I, I need to come in and give you a hand kind of thing. So um, we, the very first farm market stand that we had was this, a stand with my cute kid, but selling garlic skates, because we had planted, I think, 700 garlic that year. <laughs> but that's the only product that we had that came off the farm. And I think there was a lot of pity sales, you know, like, oh, yeah. yeah. Because, you know, when we first started, garlic scapes were not a thing mm -hmm. in the Comox Valley. Um, and so I think our first mm, first sale at the market was about $150, <laughs> which is not bad, <laughs> of garlic scapes. Mm -hmm. But, you know, not exactly a magnet for people to come to. And quite quickly I realized, you know, in order for me, us to build the diversity to get people to come to our stand is I needed to work with other farmers, and so I, I reached out to another farm, farmer named Moss. She and I had very similar kind of um, a mindset of what we wanted both out of our farms. We both wanted to be certified organic, have a diverse um, array of products, and grow healthy food for our communities. So we started off you know, from, the, from year two um, doing a combined farm stand and kind of figuring out how to work together, how this would happen. And when after year one, it worked so well that we thought, you know what, this would be really nice to formalize and to start a cooperative. Now, to start a cooperative, you need three. Two is just a partnership, but that three is the magic number to start a formal co-op. So we, you know, we put the word out, we're looking for other farmers to come and, and join us. And it took two years, but in 2014, um, Merville Organics was formed. So it was a cooperative of five farms at the time, so we found three more, it took a while, where we aggregated all of our products and sold it under the name Merville Organics. So each of our individual farms didn't have a presence at the market. We did it in an aggregated form. And look how nice it looks when you have a diversity of stuff. Because on our farm, we have a really bad wireworm problem, which means we can't grow potatoes. We can't grow winter root vegetables in the ground. Um, the wireworm just make a mess of it. But other farms could. And so they would grow those crops that, and whereas we had greenhouses on our farm, unheated, but we could get early veg, grow tomatoes really well. The other farms more on the field vegetable side. So it, it really worked out well. And 
some of the things that we were able to do was share infrastructure. So we have a shared wash station. So not every single farm had to build a wash station. A shared walk-in cooler. We each individually didn't have to buy a walk-in cooler. And a shared truck that would help take product um, to the different venues. Again, so that you don't have to all buy the truck. I mean, having a farm truck is nice, and each of us had one, but if you've ever done market safe, you know, sending food to market in a truck where you've been hauling manure, <laughs> not so much. So we had the de designated, you know, <coughs> two market truck. Um, and, you know, the co-op leased all of this, um, and you know, that was one of the benefits of being part of the co-op. Uh, the co-op, we finally um, came to the agreement that anything that we sold to the co-op, the co-op would take 23%. That was the magic number. We initially tried to do it at 15%, but we just didn't have enough capital to pay for all the things we wanted. First thing we wanted to do was hire a bookkeeper. Farmers are notoriously bad at keeping their own books mm -hmm. and running after customers who haven't paid. That's not another thing. So the 23% allowed us to, basically the farms, each farmer had their own individual farm enterprise, whether they owned their land or leased it. They were in charge and, and responsible for everything from seed to harvest. But once that product was harvested, the, the co-op then took over, provided the wash station, provided all the bags, twist ties, stickers, labels, and it provided the marketing venue. So all of that sort of stress was taken off the farmers. They just had to, you know, harvest and then it was, was put through. Now, mind <coughs> you, there's a lot of planning that goes into something like this. So all winter long, every week is pretty much planned collectively, which is really fun with farmers having to sit inside. We each have our spreadsheets open. We use a lot of Google Docs, so our Google spreadsheet, we, went, we broke Google, I think, once. <laughs> we had to like try and add up every week of our sales, and the number of cells, we actually reached the limit, and our bookkeeper was really amazed, like, oh my god, there's no more room, but anyways. <laughs> um, yeah, we use a lot of Google, uh, or at least cloud-based um, uh, coordination, so we're, we're not Total, you know, we, we don't shy away from technology that way, but much of what we did was successful because we were working together and sharing and, and being able to, each of us would also take on one of the marketing venues. So there was a CSA manager, there was a Saturday market manager, there was a restaurant manager. So each mm -hmm. of us took on that role. And we just shared the burden of what sometimes only one, I can't imagine doing all of the different mm -hmm. marketing venues that we did and just being one farm. Mm -hmm. That's, it's a heavy, heavy burden. Mm -hmm. And sharing that collectively was really um, important. Any questions so far? Yeah. Hi, I'm just wondering, so when you sell, into, you sell your stuff to the co-op, yeah. and then and you pay a bookkeeper, yeah. And the other parts of doing that's just something that you do on your own? Like the... Like the marketing? Nope, the co-op does all of that. But who, is there... We do it together so, without a financial compensation? Yeah, yeah. And I think as, well, as the co-op grew, we were then able to hire, like we started to hive off some of those roles. Yeah. So hiring someone to call all the chefs, because that's the job right. we all hated. Yeah. Um, and then you know the next step was to hire the CSA manager. Yeah. Okay. So as we started to have more um, sales, and that that pot of the 23% yeah. grew, we, we then um, wanted to step even further back away from having the farmers do those roles. Yeah. yeah. But you know, initially, and I think it's because we were, um, we were all quite conservative fiscally, like we didn't want to take on debt when we first started. We didn't take any loans out. We only self-financed this. Mm -hmm. um, so from the very beginning, we needed to see that this was a profitable enterprise before any of us would risk putting more money into it. So that's the way we always worked. We volunteered our time, um, but then as things got successful, then that time we could cut back and have um, 
have someone else, we could hire someone to do that job. Yeah. Whereas I know some other co-ops have gone in a different direction. There are grants available to start co-ops and much of that organizing and, and management role, um, many co-ops hire that from the very beginning. We weren't sure, because we didn't have the template of how this could work, we weren't sure if it would fly. Mm -hmm. So before we took that on, we figured out, let's see how we can do it and then work out from there. Yeah. I was wondering, uh, the sharing uh, plan for, for farming, was it like everybody that wanted to participate in that, they would make their own grant for the type of, of farm or farmland or power partial they wanted to actually grow, mm -hmm. and then you, you all work together towards that goal? Yeah. So we okay. don't, like the co-op didn't get involved in the individual, well, in some ways we would. Like if, if one farm needed to plant like 3,000 squash, we'd all come out and give yeah, everybody okay. a hand. But in terms of their own lease or land arrangements, that was up to each of the individual farms. I do know of other farms that actually work as worker co-ops, so that the land is owned by an entity, but the farm, you know, there are multiple farmers working on that land, and the co-op um, pays the, the farmer for their time. There's also a co-op in um, Alder Grove, Glen Valley Farm, where again, land is owned by a, co um, by a land share, and then different farm entities have different enterprises on the farm. Sounds like the perfect system. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it all depends on what your limited resource is. If land is available, and in the Comox Valley, there's a fair amount of land. Um, or if land's extremely expensive, like in the Fraser Valley, then it makes sense to share that land and share the cost. So, you know, again, what you can tailor this to, and there's probably many, many versions of how a co-op could run around a farming kind of enterprise. Yeah. Uh, just that it, it seems like it would be impossible for even like family to do this by themselves. Um, do you think that's a fair state? Because I didn't, I ne didn't necessarily think about that because looking into things like backyard market yep. gardens on the internet, a lot of people don't talk about teamwork at all, mm. and they they just kind of make it seem like okay, I have a cousin and I have a neighbor and we put up a, a stand yeah. at the farmers market, and they never they ever talk about this. So, it, it, would you think it's a fair statement that this is necessary for someone to be profitable or functioning properly as a business yeah. as well? Maybe Dirk wants to answer. It's funny, I was going to offer. I think two elements, uh, like the talk I'm going to be giving today, I'm going to talk a lot about personality and, and our, our nature. So some people are way more introverted. Like we know one farmer in Nanaimo who's been successful forever, Gary Argyle, yeah. and he's you know crippling himself at 70, but you know he's done very well and he works really hard and it's he's all by himself. So that's, and then, and so a lot of us want to be independent and then farmers in general tend to be suspicious folk. Um, because we, we always feel like it's the world against us, right? We're underpaid, we're overworked, underappreciated, and constantly are told how food is expensive. And so there's, you know, so we have this kind of natural resistance to cooperate, if that mm -hmm. makes sense. Mm -hmm. So even though Nicole and I are both activists and we've been involved in numerous community groups for, uh, for me, 30 years now, going back to Friends of Clockwood Sound, there's this kind of natural resistance to, to joining with others because right. there's relationship building, there's the trust, and the how are we going to pay, and what if you don't work as hard as me? So this, so <laughs> so true. you know, and then now I'm I'm going to be 60 this year, so I have, really have my head down even more. So we're letting more people visit and help, but you know we're not letting them get too close because we've had all these negative experiences. So if we ever did it like what you did, it'd be we'd be starting in our 30s and 40s, and then we would take the time to find the right people. Yes. So this is one of the key things. Yeah. Is um, family is one thing, because you know, you can't get rid of family. Um, it is, there, there's a huge trust factor right. in this, because it, it is so relationship driven. And, and once that trust is broken, it can really, mm. you know, it, it can cause huge issues in, in, in any kind of organization, let alone a co-op. Because I never, I never considered the social, I considered the social in the sense that a lot of like farmers open themselves to the community mm -hmm. and do things like bring people in and like right. teach them yeah. or like you know help that. them yeah. but I didn't it, nobody really talks about relationship as far as business yeah. it's completely not yeah. spoken about it's kind of a scary new concept to me like I'm, I'm really really social yeah. but I don't know 
you like you said, you do have to have a lot of trust, and I don't even have family in this country, right? So for me, it would have to yeah. be. <laughs> and you know, for me, I think a lot of what developed came out of my experience working at the sharing farm, having been around thousands of people and, and organizing them. When I when we first bought our farm, I'd be like, "Why is this taking so long? <laughs> <laughs> Why is it like we used to be able to plant, you know, thousands of feet of carrots? Why, why is this not happening?" Oh yeah, I don't have my min minions. Yeah, right? you think <laughs> So <laughs> very early on for me personally, I was like, "Come help!" Mm -hmm. And you know, what do you have to give in the beginning? It's food. Like you know, we do work trades all the time. So. And I, my personality was very much open to, like, this is a resource for the community, and, and really it is, you're, it's individually, you know, if you are comfortable with people coming on and, and getting involved like that, and if you're not, that's also okay. Like, I don't want to say that this has to be the way that you're doing it, but for me it was very comfortable having that kind of asking for help. I, I, I don't know how people who do it like by themselves. I, I really don't know how they how they do it. You're obviously having to be a jack of all trades because you yeah. know Neil and I can attest like farming is not just putting seeds in the ground and growing it. You know you are a marketer. You are an engineer. You are a soil scientist. You are like a computer whiz. Like there's all these aspects that keep the farm running. That even between the two of us, and that's four degrees in agriculture just there, we have not been able to do it all, you know? We ask for help all the time and, and have people come to the farm to give us a hand on figuring things out, yeah. And, you know, and maybe that is also the innovation, mm -hmm. is getting back to, I don't think farming was ever meant to be one farmer, one farm, right? It was always big families, mm -hmm. and if you didn't have that family, like you brought in, you know, barn raising was always mm -hmm. done collectively. Bringing the hay. Bringing in the hay. Mm -hmm. yeah. it, it's these relationships of sharing of labor that not only make things possible, but create those ties in the community. Mm -hmm. One of the first things that happened when we moved to the farm, our neighbor Ray across the road saw that we needed a hand doing certain things. And he would be over all the time, right? Giving us a hand, tearing down this building, putting up something else. You know, we'd have lunch together, we'd feed them. But then, you know, when it came time for him to go on vacation and he needed someone to clean out the chicken coop, like, how do you say no, right? Yeah. <laughs> Not a job I personally really wanted to do, but of course, I'm tied to you now. Right? Right. I've accepted the gift of your help and now I need to reciprocate. And opening yourself up, it's vulnerable being owing people, right? But I think this is something that we all need to possibly be open to, is owing our community, uh, receiving their gifts, but then knowing that when it's time for them to also ask for help, that I'm there for you. So the permanence of putting a farm in a community is not just about providing that community with food sustainably, but it's right. also about making permanent relationships. My my personal opinion, absolutely. So can I move into that? Yeah. So, um, so in, and speaking in terms of metaphor, so two quick examples. One is we've had lots of uh, cool new age couples come with their free range kids, right? And it's just ended up being a nightmare. And you don't want to say, you suck at parenting, <laughs> send your kids through private school. You know, uh, and, and so the amount of stuff that gets destroyed and lost and broken and my, my Falcon, my $60, I actually had the $100 ones with the pipping handle gone, and then, oh, I lost those, can I have another pair? Any three, three pairs in one day, and I just looked for them. And, and so it ends up being a nightmare, and so what, what ends up happening is you have to understand a whole bunch of things. And one is that everyone romanticizes everything, like relationship, having a baby, <laughs> all, everything's romanticized. And so farming is one of the most romanticized things on the planet. So people come, they're like, oh, this is going to be this amazing experience. How can I help? Weed. Nobody wants to weed. Well, we fucking hate weeding, right? <laughs> so if you want to come and help us, you have, you have to weed. Yeah. And so we realize that, that people, they want to drive the tractor. Well, we don't drive the tractor. So you don't get to drive the tractor. And if the tractor keeps driving, I'm driving the tractor. Okay? You know, you can, your kid can go my lap, but you're not driving the tractor. You're not using my chainsaw. So, so understanding that, and so now we've learned and we've trained people, uh, is they help with firewood. Hmm. 
So that's something that is really safe, right? You just pick up a piece of wood, put it in a wheelbarrow, split it, put it, right? They don't wreck anything, and then they feel like, wow, we got a really good workout, thanks so much, oh, and then we feed them, and then they're gone, right? So, and then another example of relationship is, we've been trapped in our farm now for five years, right? So we haven't gone anywhere overnight for five years. So I was nice to this couple at the farmer's market, two lovely little girls, and you know, got on my hands and knees, hugged them, was nice to them, and anyway, this couple said, just like freaking octopi, right? And so now they're house-sitting. They love us, we love them, and they just want to be part of our life. Yes. Right? So there's an example of relationship. Absolutely. It wasn't necessarily through like them coming and helping, but, but now they're being a big help. We can be here, we're getting away on a working holiday, and they live in a bus. So they're right now in a mansion All right. with yeah. a wood stove, <laughs> and they're just partying, right? <laughs> yeah. Yes. It's a scary concept to me, having moved 17 times uh, in 24 years. It's yeah. like, you're not, and we're RV people, by the way. Right. So just, right. I've lived in an yeah. RV for seven years. Yeah. So wow. it's, it's like, it's a big commitment. I think. But it's, I think if we want to transform our food system, right. yeah. It's, yeah. it's these levels of relationship that right. we, as Western society, have really stepped away from. We don't mm. want to, it's messy getting involved with people. Yeah. We <laughs> have conflict, and then, you know, we're so conflict averse. Um, so, and if I can put it out there, if any of you have conflict resolution skills, <laughs> please make yourself be known to the farming community. Because it is something that is really tearing the community apart. We don't know how to deal with each other when we start getting like disagreements. Yeah, but I, I think a lot of people are getting the farming business. Like as, as I tried it when I moved the, in Kelowna, is a lot of people look for freedom yeah. also, but they want to do something for themselves, but also be a part of something greater, right? So if you, you just like, you'll find, sometimes you'll find that special person or that group that, oh, it works great. But most of the cases are not like that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you, you gotta understand you gotta that. You gotta be uh, yeah. discerning about yeah. who, yeah. You gotta understand the, the mentality of most of the people that, that want to do that. Yeah. They actually want a piece of like, their own, their own selves in it. So that's why I think, like what you're talking about, the sharing part, I think it's great if, if you know how to engage yeah. those people. Yeah. It's, it's all about finding that. You know? And you know, quite frankly, I don't think Neil and I are really open to other people being on our farm. Mm. Like that's that's one of our mm. like um, yeah. boundaries. But I mean, sharing. I mean, as in farming on our farm, mm. we're fine having people come, right, and sharing the resources that we have in, in terms of infrastructure. But then for them to start using our tools and and you know messing up a corner. Like, ee, that's the boundary that we have. Like we're we're not going to go there, but we're open to the other side. So you know, checking. It obviously has to be something that you can live with. Now, mind you, Neil's brother is now farming on our farm, so it's family, right? And for family, you can say things that that you can't with people. That you're not <laughs> right? Yeah. I, I just want to say because all the talk about relationship building is so important, and and we want to find the right people. Mm. But I think it's really important to remember that you want to be the right person as well. Wow. And so learning your own boundaries and learning your own conflict resolution skills, being really clear about what you need, and then you're getting involved in that relationship from a really healthy place yeah. yourself. We tend to say it's somebody else's fault and <laughs> they're not working with me, right. but really the only way to take control of that and yeah. make sure is that it's... Internal, yeah. So if I can put a plug out work, for anyone who's who does workshops and stuff, conflict resolution and just mm -hmm. getting to that place, mm -hmm. I think it's a skill all of us need to really yeah. do your home. Can I have a little story? Yeah. So I, I was so honored recently, a few months ago, Keith Winlow, Winlow Farm, that's mm -hmm. a farm ship. So then you know, so there's three generations there, and then they also have the farm ship, which yeah. is a cooperative. And so, anyway, they, they're, the two twins are in their 80s, and they have managed this farm for since they were kids. Mm -hmm. And suddenly, now they got all these kids working there, and tours, and people from schools coming, mm -hmm. and invading the property. That. Yeah, and then the young guy, you know, can you uh, till this for us? You know, and can you build a fence for the pigs and everything? So anyway, so he got really upset. Mm -hmm. And then he was also fighting with the, his daughter-in-law, who's a little tiny French-Canadian firebrand, right? right? And, and so, yeah, and he's in his 80s, right? So he doesn't understand what why he's getting so upset and everything. So he came and visited us, and I spent a couple of hours going through every point. Oh, that's why she's upset. So what do I need to do? And he goes, well, with, with, what's her name? I said, you just need to listen to her and say, oh, 
well, that's interesting. And, and make her feel hurt. He goes, oh, I never thought of that. Because right? he's from a different generation. We just do what I tell you. I'm older. I'm, right? And anyway, his life like changed overnight. And I was so honored you know, that this guy would drive, you know, an hour from, and just show up at our place and say, hey, Dirk, uh, you know, I know you know stuff, you know. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and I was like, fine, so, 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 so I was like, blown away, I just, like, just, I just felt yeah. like I went to heaven. <laughs> because I was of service to this guy who I just adored because yeah. he's this amazing icon, yeah. and I know. I know. Oh, you know, I got to put that on my list of innovations. Farm counselors. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. The, social, the social stuff. Do not laugh. Yeah. It's so, so important. You're staring yeah. even more now. I mean, yeah. Okay, yeah. And, and we're doing this because we're year seven, right? We've gone through some of this, and in the beginning, probably you're, you're shiny and new. You don't worry about it, right? But it's it let us, people who kind of are seeing where the conflict is, mm. let us worry about that because mm. we'll, you know, we, but we need to identify those people in the community who have those skills that can, we can draw in and bring together. I was always for uh, putting philosophy in high school. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. So one of the other um, areas that I've been working on is um, education. Like there's sort of three things that I've seen that to, to get a new farming system up and, and running, um, farmers need access to land. They need access to capital, but they also need access to knowledge. The knowledge would have traditionally come from their own families and having been on land for generations, but you know, we've moved into a new community. Every time you move, you are relearning something. And uh, where that knowledge is coming from, it used to come from universities and extensionists who worked in the community, trying translating research. We don't have any of that anymore. BC has no agricultural extension program. They used to. There used to be experts in the Ministry of Agriculture that we could call upon, but they're not allowed to leave their offices anymore. They don't do farm visits, nothing like that. On Vancouver Island, most of you know, there's no formal post-secondary education around agriculture. I think even BIU shut down their horticulture program. It's so, so weird. They say 90% of the food that used to be eaten here until 1950-something was produced yeah, on the uh, island. And, and we're down to, like, what, 2%? Two, two yeah. Wow. Yeah. Um, yeah. In 20th, tw my opinion again, 21st century farming is just so knowledge intensive. You need to know so much about, especially if you're organic farming, the new pests that are coming up, what your soil is doing, where the fertility is, um, you know, how the market is going. And so one of the ways that um, farmers used to be able to get some of that knowledge is from each other and through institutions like Farmers Institutes. Have, has anyone heard of the Farmers Institute? These were, have been around in BC since the 18, late 1800s. Mm -hmm. And they were basically farmers came together and shared, initially they actually came together to purchase stumping powder um, mm -hmm. collectively, like basically blowing up stumps, right, and clearing land. They came together and bought that stumping powder in bulk and shared it out. Many of them still come together and buy lime in quantity and share it. And now I'm seeing, excitingly, a resurgence in interest in farmers' institutes as a way of sharing knowledge. Because again, you know, those sources of knowledge are no longer easily accessible. And sometimes it's so location specific, right? Like what works in the Comox Valley might not work here, who the resource people are. I mean, we've got totally different um, uh, weather patterns and we're in a different bioregion. So that knowledge is sometimes extremely um, place-based. So. Mm -hmm. Uh, there was a Farmers Institute already in the Comox Valley, and here's where that conflict resolution starts to happen, right? These were the guys, they're mostly beef and dairy farms, mm -hmm. and suddenly all these market gardeners are coming to their meetings and like creating this tension. They didn't like, these are the hippie lifestyle farmers. <laughs> <laughs> really, this is yep. the... Non-GMO. Oh my God, do not bring up GMO yep. at <laughs> all. So... You know, it created all a lot of tension and a lot of, you know, grumbling. And, you know, no one likes being, you can tell when the room is not 
welcoming. You know, no one says hello to you. So after a while, you know, we just stop going. <laughs> okay. Have your we own get way. it. You yeah. get it. <laughs> yeah. Your club. Your club. Yeah. And then um, Janet Tony from the Coombs Farmers Institute contacted me and said, you know, it only takes five people to start a farmers institute. It's free. You can start another <laughs> one. And I was like, huh. Because she, she said, you know, when you were part of the other institute, did you actually get like this information, this, 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 like that the ministry was sending all of us? No. Because, you know, those other guys don't even know how to use email. It's, you know, yeah. Their wives all do, do, like when notices go out, the wives are doing it all, right? And again, oh, I should mention, are we, oh, we're on this time. Uh, mostly male dominated, yep. right? Having a woman. Thank so, you. yeah. <laughs> Suspenders. Yes. Yep. So having, we started a new Farmers Institute. Again, not a new innovation, like not a new thing, but I think an innovation in that, you know, if anything, everything I've talked to you about is about collectively doing something, not doing it on your own, bringing people together. We don't hire anyone to teach. It's farmers teaching farmers. Mm -hmm. We're sharing the information that's already in the community and making it just more widely available. So not a nice shiny toy. There's no plastics involved, really. Mm -hmm. But it's just a new way of, and maybe not just a new way. We're bringing back some of the things that worked and just repurposing it for 21st century farming. So that's the end of the presentation. <laughs> any questions or any leftover anything? Feel free. Like, I think we're going to be here till about noon. Oh, Hugh. Yeah, I'm you started off the presentation showing the uh, plastic, <laughs> and uh, I just want to make this group aware that there's a uh, there's an assault on organic standards right now by uh, the hydroponic uh, industry, mm -hmm. and that uh, hydroponics uh, agriculture got approved last year as organic in in the U.S. In the U.S. Yeah. Now I'm that's that's a real big deal because uh, our values are really being threatened with being growing in soil and. Uh, you know, maintain the health of the soil and all these things just went out the window with the uh, hydroponics. And uh, people like Ellie Coleman and Jonathan Forche, you can see them on the internet that there, there's, there's a big uh, movement to try to fight that. Yeah. And just so the group is aware. Good. Yeah. You'll see, you know, bring, keep the soil in organics. That's a big push to, yeah. Because, you know, the, that plastic hydroponic, there, there might be a place for that in, in food production, yeah. but that certainly won't solve all, all of our needs. Yeah, I don't have any problem with hydroponics. Yeah. It's just, we just call it that. Yeah. yeah. And you could put certified hydroponically grown. <laughs> exactly. So one other, uh, thank you for the reminder with the skill set. One of the things that I don't realize, but you just help me remember, is the need for skills. Learning. So I can build a house from scratch by myself. And I mean electrical, plumbing, ceramic tile, concrete countertops, everything. And I don't even think about that. And also rebuild a tractor. Yeah. I own two welders. There's virtually nothing I can't do. And so what I, I, it's hard for me to grasp that most of the younger generation, whether it was they raised that way or they, you know, they've got university, they don't have these skill sets. Absolutely. And as you pointed out, farming is a lot more than just putting seeds in the ground. Yes. So one of the things that I like to work with people in this area and with you is that we start looking at workshops. Like, and I'd be willing to put yes. on workshops super cheap. And even yes. if I did a workshop where I covered everything in one day, I mean, a little bit of welding, I'd bring a welder, mm -hmm. mechanical work, yeah. um, plumbing, yeah. carpentry, soldering, everything. So people at least get it like a taste. Yes. You know, like this meeting, it was about sheet production. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, sheeps, uh, sheep. <laughs> uh, you know, that industry was really decimated with the new regs on, on slaughter. Right. And so people got rid of their, their sheep, and now there's suddenly a resurgence in reusing, using fiber, like getting better quality wool, better quality meat. Like farmers were looking at sheep poo under the microscope in this workshop because mm. they were trying to. Uh, Megan um, was teaching people how to do parasite counts mm. and, and you know figuring out when they need to actually intervene and, and what those parasites were. All that knowledge, like that you have, that certain people mm. have it. It's not 
it's not as diffuse as we think, mm -hmm. right? And so even like identifying weeds, which mm -hmm. are the edible ones, which one are the ones mm -hmm. you have to really you know, figure out. Neil has a lot of experience in putting dugouts on farms. So yes, let's share that knowledge. Because if, if we really want this food system to scale, and we need to have those pockets of knowledge, but that knowledge needs to now be diffused into the community so that we can all move together. Mm -hmm. Can I do a plug Yes, please. Sorry, we just have to go and ask for coming. Great. Um, so I'm at the shelter farm in Port Alberni, and I'm just going to leave some information here for you because we're starting a market gardener training program starting in March. And uh, it's an incredible opportunity for young people to get into um, farming on a small scale. And uh, we're, it's a wonderful opportunity that we got funding from the advanced education to pay for the tuition and books and all the expenses involved. So it's a, and it's a, we're partnering with North Island College to offer this program. It's an eight-month full-time study program. It takes you through the full cycle of uh, running a farm for a year. And then at the end, we have an incubator farm. We have access to a substantial amount of land, and that we we're offering this land to our interns that they can farm on. So it is, in a sense, it's like a cooperative. Yeah. That's what we look like in the future. And um, I'm sure I'm going to try to get there to talk to our students. <laughs> All right. So here's some information if you're interested and uh, would like to register. Thank you. Yes. Thanks. Well, thanks everybody.